Can you hear me now? Yeah. <laughs> We're good. All right. We just eat lunch, so hopefully you're not you know, in that semi uh, total state where your blood sugar starts to crash and things just go to pot. But if I see things you know, starting to decline a little bit, we can always do some exercise. <laughs> visited someone's house. that there was a wise and diligent gardener. And I think we can say the same thing about our families. God created marriage. We just heard about that. And he created the institution of family. And when two people, a husband and wife, decide that they're going to live together in a godly marriage, on godly principles, that becomes the foundation. It's a prerequisite, actually, for a properly functioning family. And marriage seeking to function according to God's word creates a faithful family that becomes a building block of society and the church. So if we look at our society and we look at our churches and we see a decline in those, that gives us some indication of the spiritual condition of our families. Because family is the building block of the church, is the building block of society. If we look at our marriages and we see, or excuse me, we look at our families and we see problems, that gives us some indication of the spiritual condition of the family. So this illustrates, I think, the connection between society slash church and family and between family and marriage. And I would say at this point it would be good to look at the institution of family, what Satan has done in terms of attacking it, and what it would mean to stand on that institution. So as, as an institution, even secular circles recognize the importance of the family. Human uh, environmental sciences at the University of Missouri have said that uh, families are crucial in the development of human competence and character. Families play a critical role in how well children do in school. They play a critical role in how those people do as adults on the job and they play a critical role in how people contribute to society in general. And families are first and foremost in the development of human character and competence. And we can trace a lot of problems in society back to <coughs> dysfunctional family relationships. So let's take a look at Scripture's view of the family, just a snapshot of it. Turn with me, if you will, to Genesis 1.28. Genesis 1.28. And if you hear me up here singing the books of the Bible, you know I'm trying to recall which order they came in here. So, so far we're in good shape because it's an easy one to find. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth on the earth. So this was God's plan for humankind as it relates to the earth, to be fruitful, multiply, subdue it. To accomplish this, we see and we've heard already that God created male and female, he brought them together, and he gave them the command to multiply. We talked briefly about this also, this next point, but looking at this picture of the family, we cannot ignore marriage. So if we look at Genesis 2.14, just flip over a page if you have the right uh, version of the Bible here. And Genesis 2.14, is that what I want? I don't think so. No, 24 then? Yeah, we'll go with 23. And it, Genesis 2, 23, and Adam said, 
This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, here's a key point, shall a man, singular, therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife, singular, and they shall become one flesh. So the point to make here is that marriage was intended to be monogamous and it was intended to be for life. Pick up a couple verses above that and we see why. Um, God said it's not good for man to be alone. So we understand that marriage and family creates love and companionship, and that's the intention in the scriptures, throughout the scriptures. And it's interesting to note that human beings seem to be the only creature that cannot function well without love and companionship. So if you look at babies that don't receive love, they have a higher mortality rate, and children that don't receive love can develop disaffective syndrome, where they can't sense and receive love. So the lack of love uh, can cause troubles and families provide a natural love and a natural companionship that humans need and it's a place of peace and acceptance and encouragement where situations of life can be met with grace. Let's take another look at another piece of the family and to there we will turn to Psalms 127, 3 and 4. So we've, we've found out some things about marriage, about family so far. It's going to involve a mom and a dad in a monogamous, faithful relationship. There's going to be love in this situation. Very good to find my verse. Psalm 127. And here the psalmist says, Lo, children are in heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of thy youth. You've heard people say, yeah, you know, we're leaving for the weekend, get those kids out of our hair, or, you know, we'll keep them busy with this, get them out of our hair, they're going to bother. But that's not the view of Scripture. The view of Scripture is that children are a heritage. It's, it's an inheritance. It's, it's a good thing Amen. to have children and uh, to, see, to, to view it in that respect. And we'll talk a little bit more about that, but it's, it's the idea of a stewardship. This is something that um, you have received, that you have a, a, a faithfulness to in the, dis, in the duty of, of the execution of your duty, rather. So looking at another aspect of this snapshot of the family, turn with me to Exodus 20.12. Exodus 20.12. What is a family supposed to look like? Here's another aspect of it. It says, Honor thy father and mother, that thy days may be long in the land which the Lord God giveth thee. So the family is to be a place of love and acceptance. It's also to be a place where there's respect and honor for the parents. And then if we go to Exodus 20, 14, just a couple verses down, this is reiterated throughout scripture, thou shalt not commit adultery. And the issue of fornication is also talked about throughout scripture. What does that ensure? What, what is the importance of that? <coughs> Doesn't that prevent, if, if followed, children being born outside of a natural home where they'd be taken care of, or where they'd have love, where they'd have somebody providing for them? So we start to see this intention of the family here and then the last thing that I'm going to point out is in Proverbs 22.6. And we'll come back to this verse here again. Proverbs 22.6. And here it says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. So let's think back to the very first bullet point we talked about, which was God's plan for mankind in the world to subdue and multiply. And to do that, you have to have some kind of organizational structure, right? Are any of you all in here ever had anything to do with supervision? 
Yes. Huh. So there's some supervisors in here. You understand that if you just bring a group of people together without a plan, without somebody to kind of guide and direct, that not a whole lot is going to get accomplished. Huh. So if we're going to subdue, multiply in the earth, there's going to have to be an organizational structure of some kind on a micro level, and we'll talk about the macro level here in just a minute uh, in the next session. But on the micro level, the family becomes a training ground. So there's a mom and a dad that are going to teach first the young people how to do some things. And that mom and that dad, as we look through scripture, they've got roles. They're not exactly the same. Everybody's got a role that they play. So that's one part of the organizational structure. The next part is the mom and the dad are going to become old and the children are going to rise up and take their place. So they need to be trained in this training ground to be able to do that. So there's an organizational structure in place uh, with the institution of the family. And that, I think, a little snapshot briefly outlines the structure God set forth as far as the institution of the family. But, unfortunately, mankind has not, throughout the ages, followed that. In this country, we've seen quite a shift in that in recent times. And even Christians, I think, Christian parents, uh, we are guilty of not faithfully following that. So, Let's talk about how Satan has attacked the institution of the family. And this will take just a minute, so bear with me as we go through this. But if we look at some current statistics, just as, a, as an indicator, uh, research, and, and you don't need to do research to see how the family has changed, but research and people who study the family uh, express astonishment at how rapidly it changes. They write an article. And by the time that article is published, there's been changes again. There is a professor at the John Hopkins University who, I'll quote here, this churning, this takeover, turnover in our intimate partnerships is creating complex families on a scale we've not seen before. It's a mistake to think this is the end point of enormous change. We are still very much in the midst of it. So what are some of the changes that occur? Cohabitating couples is one. That used to be something not as common, at least in this country, uh, but from 96 to 2012, that's increased 170%, from about 2.9 million to 7.8 million. In 1960, it was very common. In fact, almost three quarters of the population of families had children, and it was the first marriage, and the families lived all together. That situation is now in the minority. There's other. Uh, there's so many other uh, styles or varieties of that. Another factor is uh, with gay marriage comes what they call a gay boom. So we've got children living with gay parents, and that has uh, reached about 2 million people, or 1 in 37 people under the, under the age of 18. So you look at some of these statistics, and they're, they're discouraging, right? They're not encouraging. But as Richard pointed out, these are symptoms, they are not the root cause. And I think it's interesting here, to think about this, because society for sure, and oftentimes the church, does what? They go after the symptom, and they try to fix or correct or solve the symptom. And when you contrast that with God's word, what is God's word? <coughs> it goes to the heart of the issue. How do we know that? God's word tells us it does, right? Does anyone know Hebrews 4.12? They got that memorized. Someone surely does. You want to recite it? Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to dividing asunder the soul and spirit and joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. How can that be? The word of God is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. It's able to pierce to the root issue. And I want to illustrate that for you. Turn with me to Acts 17. Acts 17. This is something I was reading it. This account, I've read it thousands of times. And maybe not thousands, but a lot of times. And it never really hit me. And finally, one day it kind of hit me. Acts 17. And we'll start at verse 15. So Paul, the Apostle Paul is at Athens. And they that conducted Paul brought him unto Athens, and receiving a commandment unto Silas and Timotheus, for to come to him with all speed, they departed. Now when Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him 
when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Think with me for a minute of what that would look like. Is idolatry going to produce living conditions, situations that are good, or is it likely to produce terrible living conditions, manipulations, and all kinds of awful things? Right? Yeah, I would say it's going to produce lots of things. Was this just off in a corner, or was this prevalent and pervasive in the city? Paul says the city was wholly given to it, right? So what did he do? Did we need, and what would the society do? Society, maybe the church would organize, you know, maybe some of these people be clothed, maybe they're, they're not provided for, maybe there's some homelessness, maybe there's some drug problems, some substance problems, we'd start trying to solve those issues, get some coats for these people, some food kitchens going. But what does Paul do? So we'll pick up in 16 again. So Paul, he waited for him. Now at the end of the verse he says, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Verse 17, therefore. So on the basis of that situation, in verse 17, therefore, he disputed in the synagogues with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. And he goes on to give them the gospel. So he's, sometimes I think maybe God's word is a little too simple for us. So on that same note, turn with me to Philippians 1.27. So Paul just gave him the gospel, right? He saw a situation in the city, terrible conditions, maybe terrible conditions within marriage and family. We don't know, but we can imagine. And he preached the gospel. 127, Philippians. Paul says, only let your conversation, and that word conversation simply means your conduct, your, your daily activities, only let your conversation as becoming the gospel of Christ. So that tells us that the gospel is more than just the bullet points, Christ died, was buried, and rose again. It's able to produce a certain life in us. There's power in the gospel, and Paul tells us that in Romans 1.16. Does anyone have that one memorized? Who can quote Romans 1.16? Surely someone here knows Romans 1.16. So you're not, we're not ashamed. But are we sometimes ashamed of the gospel? It's kind of simple, isn't it? But can it solve the problem? If we address the root issue in these situations, will that start to address automatically the situations and the symptoms? I think it would. So let's go back now to what we're talking about here. We're talking about Satan's attack. We're talking about some statistics that indicate, at least in recent times in this country, that things have changed with respect to the institution of marriage, the institution of the family. And we're talking about these being symptoms, not the root cause. So what is the root cause? What is the root issue? I think the root issue has to do with God's word. And Satan's attack, in my opinion, and you're free to have your own opinion that's different, um, I think Satan's attack has been, throughout time, an attack on God's word primarily. So let's look at Genesis chapter 3. We've looked at this already. Genesis chapter 3. Verse number one. Genesis 3 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And when he saw, when he, and he said unto the woman, Yea, had God said. So Satan is questioning what God said. He's asking Eve, has God said, you should not eat of every tree of the garden? And Eve replies in verse 2, And the woman said unto the serpent, We may not eat of the fruit of the tree of the garden. We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. So as Stephen pointed out, she was not accurate. There was nothing that God said about not touching him. So she added to God's word. Satan questioned it. Eve added to it. And then Satan says in verse 4, And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. Was that true? Wasn't it just a few verses before that God clearly said, Ye shall surely die. So Satan first questions God's word. 
when Eve misquotes God's word, he does not correct it. And he then goes and outright denies that that's what would happen. He denies God's word. And throughout the Bible, you can see instances where God's word has been attacked and corrupted and hid and different things have happened to it. And I think Satan is behind that because if he can put doubt in God's word, if he can take people's attention off God's word, the power is changed, right? Is this, didn't, didn't Barney just say that this book is living and active? That's true, right? It's living and active. But what has to happen? What did Paul tell the Thessalonian believers? In Thessalonians, he said, when we came, you received the word of God, you received the word that you received from us, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, what? That effectually worketh in you that believe. You have to believe it. Will it do any good sitting on your counter or your coffee no. table? No, nothing's changed there, but you have to put it in and you have to believe it. So, thinking along that line, how does that inform us as to this changing statistics? So has this strategy of Satan been successful? Has this attack on various institutions through attacking God's word been successful? So here's some information from Pew Research. Evangelical Protestants, so these are, I hate to say it this way, the cream of the crop. Um, the more conservative, the more spiritual of the Protestants, maybe if you were to, to think of it that way, just from a generic standpoint, 30% of these people, when asked how do they determine right and wrong, said they do not use God's word, they use something else. What do you think they use? Common sense. Common sense, not God's word. 30% evangelical Protestants. Only about half of this group, only about 50% of the evangelical Protestants believes God's word should be understood literally. Just over 60% of evangelical Protestants read the Bible once a week. Unfortunately, religious groups as a whole, almost 50% never read it. And this was another statistic I read. Well, about 50% of people in church last Sunday cannot remember a single spiritual insight. So is this something that Christianity at large or Christian, what do you say, Christian dumb? Christian dumb. Christian dumb. <laughs> is, uh, is this something that we're believing, that we want to have some understanding of, that we're spending time in? No, it is not. And has that created a result? I think it has. And I think that tends to be the root issue. So as Satan has been influential in corrupting and causing doubt about God's word, we see changes in societies that had believed it before. We see changes in Christian families. Um, nearly half of evangelicals, 18 to 25, believe they favor same-sex marriage. It's kind of strange, right? If you believe this book, it would be hard to think how you could come to that conclusion. So it is just an indication of what happens when we kind of turn away from God's word as the authority in our life and allow the American culture to rub off on us. And it, I think as Christian parents, and I'm not necessarily people in this room, I think it's just Christians in general, we've not taken this responsibility of raising our children seriously. We've gotten distracted with so many different things that we could be doing or all our attention, and we tend to put this a little bit on the back burner. And I think it's true to some degree, even in gray circles. And the result is that we've not, we've not taught children how to use God's word in their daily life. So, kind of having looked now at a snapshot of what God had expected of the family, just in general terms, how Satan has attacked it through doubt in God's word, and, and there's certainly other things that he has done, that's, that's clear. Um, and the result of that is a cause in our Christian families and in our society in general. What does it mean to stand? So what would it mean if we're going to stand on the institution of the family? What would that look like? So first of all, let's look at this issue of standing. 1 Corinthians 10, 12. 1 Corinthians 10, 12. Mm -hmm. 
And here the Apostle Paul tells the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 10, 12, Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth, take heed, lest he fall. So standing and falling are the opposites. They are antonyms, right? Not synonyms. So standing is not falling. If we just look at that English word, there's lots and lots of definitions of it, but it, it basically means to succeed, to maintain one's ground, not to fail, to be acquitted, to be safe. That's the issue of standing. And I think the issue of standing in many ways is the same or similar as the issue of being faithful. It's faithfulness. 1 Corinthians 4.2. 1 Corinthians 4.2. Turn with me there just a couple chapters back. First Corinthians 4 2, moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. So, didn't we read Psalms 127 that said, Children are the heritage of the Lord? Can we get a principle that would apply to people living in any dispensation that we're stewards in many ways of the resources that we have? And we have to be faithful with those with those stewardships. So children are something that we have and we're stewards of, right? For a period of time, they live with us, and uh, before we know it, they're growing up and asking for the car keys and then thinking they like some girl, and then all your help is gone, and there you are left to do all the chores all by yourself. So, uh, if that hasn't happened for any of you yet, I'm sorry to burst your bubble, but that's what's going to happen. So. But it's this idea of being faithful. And faithfulness, again, if we just look at the English word, there's lots of definitions, but it basically means firmly adhering to duty, to, of true fidelity, loyal, true to allegiance as a faithful subject. Turn with me to Ephesians 6. Now we knew in a conference about Satan's attack on anything, we were going to get to Ephesians 6 because that's the passage where Paul explains that we're wrestling. We are in a war. It's not with flesh and blood. So it kind of looks like it is, but that's not what's behind it. We're wrestling against principalities, powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. And he talks about the armor of God. And when you get talking about, especially for God, and I, I imagine girls are a little bit different, but when you start talking about wrestling and warfare with guys, we're ready to go, right? We want to do something. And... Sometimes we can get busy doing something and ignore the very things that God has asked us to do. So I think that's what's interesting about this passage. Ephesians 6, look at verse 13. Paul says, Wherefore, so on the basis of what he's just said that we're wrestling, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Verse 14. Stand, therefore, having your loins girded about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. So we have this issue of standing. When we might think we're going to go do something, maybe we'll write our senator or do this or do that. God's saying, not necessarily can't do those things, but do the things that would be required of a faithful steward. Do the things that I've asked you to do. I've got another verse here, and this one I'm not going to fall on my sword on, but turn with me to 1 Timothy and if you guys have different ideas on this, I'd be happy to hear them afterwards. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18 and 19. Paul is writing a letter to Timothy. And he's talking to him about some things. And in verse 18, he's talking about a charge that he committed unto him. He said, This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. So are we talking about a similar thing than what we were just looking at in Ephesians chapter 6? I think we are, right? There's some similarity there. We're talking about a warfare, a wrestling that we have with principalities and powers. But I, I'm not 100% sure, but I'm believing that verse 19 defines what good warfare is going to look like. So let's go back to verse 18, the last part of it. That thou by them mightest war a good warfare, doing what? Holding faith. We can be good war warriors, good soldiers, if we hold the faith. If we are good stewards, if we're faithful to following what God has asked us to do. If we stand. Psalm 
So, what would faithfulness and standing look like in our lives? In Peoria, in Wisconsin. That's not a talent. It's like the world's biggest talent, I think, but it's not a talent per se. Um, in, in Michigan, how would faithfulness look in a family, in the institution of a family? So first of all, I think we have to note that whatever we do, people see it, right? They see it. So turn with me to a couple passages here. So the first one is a negative example. 1 Corinthians 1.11. 1 Corinthians 1.11. Just to illustrate this idea that what we do, people see and know about. Paul is writing to Corinthians, to the Corinthian believers, and he says in verse 11 of chapter 1, For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the household of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. So word of the problems at Corinth had spread around quite a little bit. So, again, it's this idea of what we do, other people see it. So let's look at a good example of what we're doing people see. That can be found in 1 Thessalonians 1.8. 1 Thessalonians 1.8. We can start in verse 7, actually. 1 Thessalonians 1.7. So that ye were in samples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place that your faith, the God word, is spread abroad so that we need not speak anything. So let me ask you a grammatical question. For from you sounded out. Is any of you familiar with an active sentence or a passive sentence? Active always occurs when you do something good, right? Hey guys, I won the trophy. That's active. I won the trophy. When something gets broken, then we tend to use the passive voice. Uh, Stephanie, sorry, the microphone just broke. Did the microphone break or did I break it? So it's passive, right? I think this is written passive. For from you sounded out the word. So they weren't necessarily, not that they weren't, but they weren't necessarily sending out people and having an outreach and knocking on doors and passing out tracts and everything else. I think they were being faithful. And because he says, Everywhere your faith to God would have spread abroad. So they were doing what they were supposed to be doing. They were faithful. And that was noticeable. I mentioned to Richard, I asked him if he homeschooled. And he said he did. I said, you can tell. I don't know how exactly, but when we go to the store in different places, you can always spot homeschool families, right? There's a difference. And when we're doing what we're supposed to be doing as Christians, there should be some difference. There should be some witness in a family. If we're standing on the institution of the family, is a perfect vehicle to be a witness. And God instructs us to raise godly children, does he not? Turn with me to, uh, to Titus 1.6. Titus 1.6. Verse 6. So we're talking about here a passage, it's a parallel passage to 1 Timothy 3, about qualifications of bishops and deacons the leadership of the church. And here he says, If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children. So the idea, I think, it's not stated directly, but the implication is that it, it's a qualification for somebody in position of authority in the church should be that they've been able to manage their own family. Not that they have faithful children. So if that's a qualification using some deduction here, you should be responsible whether your children are faithful or unfaithful. So if you've done your job right, can I say it that way? That's going to lead to faithful children. And therefore, you would be qualified to be in a position of leadership in the local assembly. So again, it's the idea that, number one, that you should be able to do that. God expects you to do that. But then if you do that, that becomes an example. If you don't, it still becomes an example, just not a good one. And we looked at this verse, I think, too. Titus 2, oh, maybe we didn't. Titus 2, 5. Look over a page. Titus 2, 5. So Titus 
So he's talking about the aged women, and I love the way he words that because no woman is going to admit to that before she's truly aged. So it's a self-fulfilling criteria, right? You're going to push that off for quite a little while. Probably a good idea. I mean, when we're young, what do we know? But as we kind of raise our kids and watch our grandkids raise, maybe at some point we become aged and we start to know some things. So that's just kind of a silly aside. But um, verse 5. So what are the aged women to teach the younger women? They're to teach them to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands. Why? That the word of God be not blasphemed. So again, it's the idea that a family is a witness if we're faithful in living according to God's word. Not that we don't make mistakes. We make plenty of mistakes. That's not the issue. It's what we see as the authority and what we are trying to do based on that authority in our lives. So looking at, again, at this idea of standing on the institution of family, we know it's, it's a witness. What are some things that we would do if we are going to be faithful in standing on the institution of the family? One is, one of the verses that was kind of a key verse that was assigned to me, and that's Proverbs 22. It's the idea of training our children, educating our children. So let's look back at Proverbs 22. And while you're going there, are there any people here that enjoy apple pie? By a show of hands, apple pie, apple pie. So, okay, the wonderful singer. Whose apple pie is the best? Mom's apple pie. Well, how many would agree with that? Mom's apple pie. But you don't have the same mom as she does, right? I'm just guessing. Isn't that interesting? Where am I going with that? As parents, we can produce opinions in our children that are strong, that are lifelong, about the way potatoes should be made, the way an apple pie should be constructed and eaten, and other things. So if we can do that and those stick with us for life, I mean, how many of you drive the same brand of vehicle that your parents thought was a good brand of vehicle? I do, and my kids. We like Subarus. We're driving a GMC, but don't get me started. <laughs> it breaks down from time to time. It really annoys me. But Subaru doesn't make a big enough vehicle for mush and people. But if we can put some of those things in, vehicle brand is important, right? We, we might come to blows over something like that. How much more should we be able to instruct and put instill in our children a love of God's word and ability to learn God's word and study it for a lifetime? And that's really what we're talking about. <coughs> Proverbs 22, 6 is train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. And I've heard people say that, actually I heard somebody give a, a Sunday school lesson on this. They said, that, that's just kind of a guideline. It doesn't always happen. That's why the book is called Proverbs, Not Promises. I tend to disagree, but um, I don't know why they would say that. But I think God has given us as parents instructions, and we submit ourselves to those instructions. We, subs we make our personal desires and things that we might want to pursue subservient to fulfilling this obligation. Turn with me to another one that talks about training our children. Deuteronomy 6, 4-9. Deuteronomy 6, 4 to 9. This is an Old Testament passage, but I think this principle would apply. There are several principles we can pull out here, but I think these apply to people living in any dispensation. So he says in verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. He's just given them the law. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. So you're going to train somebody, are you going to have to be a sold out believer in it yourself? Why do you think my boys like Subarus? Because I honestly like Subarus. I believe in Subarus. And that's a silly thing, but I think it's something you can understand, right? It's something you can get your head around. That if you really do believe something, you can pass that along. And I think a lot of times in our families, we've had opinions 
that really aren't founded in anything. And then it, the children, when it gets their turn to decide if they're going to really believe this or not for themselves, well, that's just mom and dad's opinion. And the school's been teaching me that mom and dad are kind of old funny guys. And these are the new ways now, so we believe something different. But if it's founded in God's word, that doesn't change. <coughs> so back to Deuteronomy. So we've got to believe it. Verse 6, and these words. I'm going to stop right there. What is the common thing that we hear when we're supposed to teach children? Give them some story that's kind of, oh, I don't know, the equivalent of Gerber baby food. Right? Kind of blended up and something they can swallow and understand. But unfortunately, a lot of those stories, I think, take away from the power of God's word because it becomes just a story. It's just like any other bedtime story that they hear. And sometimes those stories aren't even accurate. Here, Moses says these words. And these words, which I command thee this day, shall be in thy heart. And thou shalt teach them, teach these words diligently unto thy children. And thou shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thy house. When thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, when thou risest up, and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thy hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house and on thy gates. I do this every Sunday from 10.45 to 12.30. <laughs> Don't you get the idea that this is applying God's word to just the everyday things that you're doing all day long? Doesn't that make sense? Mm -hmm. Just as you're doing everything, you weave God's word into it. In this particular case, the law. It can be done. I mean, when your children, is, as small as they are, when they make mistakes, can't you explain to them in grace, this is what God has to say about this, this is what we should be doing? And they start to understand that's where you go for the answers. So Deuteronomy 31, as long as we're in Deuteronomy, we might as well get the bang to the buck here and go to chapter 31. Deuteronomy 31, 9 to 13. Deuteronomy 31, 9 to 13. But there's one principle here that I think is interesting that we'll want to look at. And it says in verse 9, And Moses wrote this law and delivered it unto the priests of the sons of Levi, which bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord, and unto all the elders of Israel. And Moses commanded them, saying, At the end of every seven years, in the solemnity of the year of release, in the feast of tabernacles, when all of Israel is come to appear before the Lord thy God in the place where he shall choose, thou shalt read this law before all Israel in their hearing. Gather the people. And here's the point. Gather the people together, men, women, children, and the strangers, the proselytes. So I think the principle there is families can learn together. They should learn together. And we'll come back to that idea here in a minute. And now we're going to flip to the New Testament quite a few books away. Sorry, I'm making you, I know we're under grace, but I'm, I'm making you do some works here. First Timothy 4. <laughs> 1 Timothy 4, 13. So Paul again is instructing young Timothy, and he says in verse 13, 1 Timothy 4, Till I come, give attendance to reading. Doesn't that sound like something that's a little too simple? I mean, we've got to add something to it, right? But he says, give attendance to reading to exhortation, to doctrine, neglect not the gift that is in thee, which is given thee by, the, by prophecy with the laying on the hands of the presbytery. Meanwhile, meditate on these things, give it thyself wholly to them, that thy property may appear to all. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine, continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt save both thyself and them that hear thee. Give attendance to reading. Make sure in your family, as you're training your children, as you're educating your children, that you make reading the scripture a priority. Read it together with them. I like what, you, did you say you read scripture at meal times? That's a good thing. Another verse that I'm sure you were bound to think was going to come up in a topic on the family is Ephesians chapter 6 verse 1. 
So here is um, still on this idea of if we're going to be faithful and standing on the institution of family, we've got to recognize this. We're going to be a witness. People are going to see what we're doing. One of the things that we do is that we're faithful to God's word in doing as parents is educating our children. So that's what we've been talking about. And it says here, Ephesians 6, 1, children, obey your parents. Now, grammatically, I like picking on people in the front row, and Desiree is pretty near a teacher. Grammatically, if it says children, come, what is that? That's direct address, right? It's direct, she agrees, it's, it's got to be true. It's direct address. <laughs> So what that means is, when Paul wrote this, he addressed that verse to children. Children were in attendance when that was being read. But interestingly, as we keep reading, we find out that fathers were going to be in attendance too, because he says fathers and other people. So he's addressing this. People are learning God's word together. So that's one thing. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment of promise, that it may be well with thee. God's word has principles that make for good life, that make for successful living just in general circumstances, general, you know, just in general. And thou mayest live long on the earth, and ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. It doesn't say mothers, but we know mothers are involved. How do we know that? We just got done reading chapter 6, verse 1, children obey your parents, plural. That's mom and dad. So, Moms are involved in the education of children. And we can see that um, in another situation here. If you turn over to 1 Timothy 5.14, 1 Timothy 5.14, we looked at this earlier today. 1 Timothy 5.14. <coughs> I will, therefore, that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion of the adversary to speak reproachfully. So clearly, Paul instructing here that women would guide the house. And just as an aside note, could it possibly be that God knows what he's talking about? Are women, and I understand this is a generalization, but are they generally really, really good multicasters? Yes. Right? The men tend to be more sequential. If you give me 13 things to do, I'll get 13 of them done. But it's, I'm going to do one after the other. <laughs> give me 13, I might go crazy. <laughs> but my wife is quite capable of keeping all these little things going and all at one time. She's got all this stuff going on that, that relates to guiding the house. The father is directly addressed because the father is responsible. And throughout scripture, you can see that God placed the authority in the father, in the dad. So it's the father's responsibility to make sure that it happens, right? One time I was involved, in, I was in middle management for a good part of my life. And the big boss said, you know, do this, and all the department heads come together, and we had not done what he asked us to do, and oh, in that moment he was yelling at us, why? I can still hear him. You know, I'm thinking, why didn't I do that? It's so simple. Why didn't I do it? But when we're when we've got the responsibility, we have to make sure it gets done within our department. We have to make sure the fathers have to make sure that the education of the children gets done. Interesting thing about that is you can ignore that responsibility, right? And there aren't immediate direct consequences necessarily. Over time they will right away there isn't so it's kind of easy to to just ignore it nothing really bad happens right away and notice that the father is supposed to raise him in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord and that word nurture is kind of an interesting word for a man we understand that women nurture right that's something that we're told women do and I agree with that but that word nurture means instruct so it's it's instructing children and being careful about how we do it and I think us dads know that sometimes you can push mom a little bit, but generally speaking, not always, but generally speaking, dad gets pushed to a point and then the hammer drops. And sometimes it's in grace and sometimes it's in our flesh. So it's something we do have to watch out for that we don't, that we don't provoke them to wrath. But Paul is our apostle, right? Where he tells us to follow him. And he's given us some instruction as fathers, I think, that we can see in his example 
godly <coughs> nurturing and godly exhortation. It's throughout his epistles. If we look at a couple examples in 1 Thessalonians, we can see 1 uh, Thessalonians chapter 2, for instance. Paul comes into Thessalonica and he says, when we, here's how we behaved ourselves when we showed up. Verse 7, chapter 2. But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherishes her children. Drop down to verse 11. As you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father of his children. So we've got some ideas here through scripture of how we should and could relate to our children as we instruct and educate and correct their behaviors. So that's one thing that we can do. We understand we got to be, we're going to be a witness. We understand that being faithful as a Christian parent is going to involve educating our children. And scripture is very clear on that. That should be a priority. We should give attendance to reading and explain to our children how to utilize God's word in just the everyday details of life every day. Another thing we need to do is finish our course. Here's, and we can see these principles again in Paul's epistles. Um, turn with me to 1 Corinthians 9, 1 Corinthians 9, 24. And it's just the idea of finishing something. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 and 26. And Paul says, Know ye not that they which run in a race run off, but one receiveth the prize? So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I run therefore, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. And we can see another uh, epistle, 2 Timothy 4, where Paul kind of keeps going on this same thought or this same principle. 2 Timothy 4, verse 7, he's nearing the end of his life here, and he's uh, again writing a letter to Timothy. And verse 7, chapter 4, I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. So that can be applied to being Christian parents and finishing our course. And what would that look like? And again, it's this idea of faithfulness, it's an idea maybe of unselfishness. I know you've heard this. Parents are so grateful their kids can kind of make their own mac and cheese by themselves. And finally, you know, we don't have to be home just right on time. And you know, Probably the most important time in your child's life is between the hours of 3 and 8 when you aren't there. So finish your course. And I have a quote here that I kind of like. It's from Margaret Hefferman, and she said, your children need you more as they grow older, not less. That's the dirty little secret of motherhood. <laughs> when they are tiny, they need feeding, changing, dressing, and some fairly undemanding forms of engagement. Anyone can do this. As they get older, they need moral guidance, health guidance, social guidance, and help with trigonometry. Only you can do this. And I would argue, I would suggest to you that only you are qualified. You have a natural bond with your child, right? They have a natural bond with you. No one else in the world has that. And I don't want to pick on youth pastors, but what do youth pastors have to do to get your kids to hang out with them and like them and listen to them? Bribe them with pizza and be immature. <laughs> <laughs> the problem is they can never exercise any authority in that relationship because there's no bond. So that's one thing. The second thing is, you have a God-given responsibility to teach those children, and they have a God-given responsibility to obey you. And so it's the perfect situation to be able to do that. So it can't be delegated to other people. So that's another point. Another, and a, a third one would be to walk worthy. We talked about it just a little bit when we looked at Deuteronomy. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. So if you're going to teach something, it's got to be something you believe in. Subarus, you've got to believe. <laughs> <laughs> and 
And I think one weakness of the grace movement is we as grace believers can tell you from Scripture that when a believer was saved, he was spiritually identified with Christ, he died with Christ, he was raised with Christ, he's now seated with Christ in heavenly places in Ephesians 2, right? However, sometimes we miss the point that this is not just an abstract thought in theology. God Almighty did something in our lives, and that should make a radical, radical change, right? So, walk worthy. Make it a point to walk a sanctified life as a family. So, Colossians 3. Colossians 3.17. I really like this passage. And whatsoever ye do, in word or deed, what? Do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. So then he goes on to tell you what the whatsoever things are going to be. Or at least what they're going to start with. And isn't this a familiar list? Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. So we're, we're back to the institution of marriage. That's where the grace life is going to begin, at that marriage. And then he goes on to say, children, obey your parents. But now we've got the institution of the family. So these are the building blocks of society, of the church. And this is where the grace life is going to be lived out. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Servants, verse 23. Sounds a lot like verse 17. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily, <coughs> as unto the Lord, and not unto men. <coughs> well, I have a quote for you along that idea. So we're walking worthy, we're educating our children, and I spent quite a few years in the power sports business. And I probably met everybody in West Michigan that had a special child. There's lots of them. And I went and watched a lot of these people race because that's what they told me. Their child is super, super gifted. And I was like, oh, my goodness. <laughs> they can barely get on the motorcycle, let alone be gifted. But uh, So I don't want to mislead you with what I'm about to say, that you've got to have gifted kids or do these super, super things. But at the same time, God's word is clear. Whatever we do, we should do it heartily. We should put some effort into it. So I want to challenge you. This is a book called Homeschooling the Right Choice. It was written by Christopher Clicka. And it has a couple uh, chapters on the history of homeschooling in this country. And here he says, at least nine colleges were quickly established in the middle 1700s, including Yale, Harvard, Princeton. All of them were founded on Christianity and emphasized biblical and classical studies. The entrance admissions for those colleges were stiff. <coughs> a freshman in the College of William and Mary in the 1700s had to be able to read, write, converse, and debate in Greek. The King's College in New York required applicants to translate the first chapters, first ten chapters of the Gospel of John from Greek into Latin. Yet John Jay entered the college at age of 14. John Colton, John Cotton, I'm sorry, Ezekiel Rogers, Reverend Witherspoon, and Jonathan Edwards at age 13. And Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, James Monroe at age 16, having met these requirements. So there's some things you can accomplish with ordinary children, but it takes effort. Another thing that we can do as families that would be, I think, a way of standing on the institution of the family is meeting the needs of others. So turn with me to Romans 12, Romans chapter 12. Verse 9, Romans 12, 9. And here Paul says, verse 9, chapter 12, Let love be without dissimulation, abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good, and kindly affection one to another with brotherly love and honor, preferring one another. 
not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, and here it is, distributing to the necessity of saints given to hospitality. Can I suggest you can do that if you are raising, if you have a godly marriage and you're raising faithful children, that isn't that difficult to do. But if you aren't, I think it's quite difficult. I'm sure you've been to other people's houses, right? And sometimes that's been kind of a you know, shocking experience. We were at some place and the kids were being a little bit noisy like kids sometimes are, and it, it's getting to the point of distraction. We can't even have a conversation because it keeps getting interrupted. And finally, the, guy, the dad jumps up and like rushes his kid and just grabs him and like, like we're <laughs> Kind of makes you a little on edge. Their house wasn't a house where there was order and peace, and that limits what they're able to do as a family. So what are some ways that God's word shows us that we can distribute to the necessities of the saints? First Timothy 5.16, something that was mentioned earlier today. First Timothy 5.16 is one example. It says, if any man or woman that believeth have widows, let them relieve them, and let not the church be charged. So the family can take care of its own widows. That's one way. Uh, 1 Corinthians 16 is a, just another example. And I think this guy would be interesting to meet when we get to heaven. 1 Corinthians 16 Verse 15. First Corinthians 16, 15. I beseech you, brethren, you know the house of Stephanus that is in the first fruits of Achaia, and that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. I'm like an interesting cat to me. And I think the thing to note is it's the household. It's, there was, that house was involved in that endeavor. Turn with me to Philipp, uh, Philemon. I have Philemon 1, 7. I think technically that's correct. Philemon 1, 7. Here's a similar situation. Verse 7 of Philemon. Paul's writing to this person and he says, We have great joy and consolation in thy love because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. What did Philemon have in his house? Verse 2 And to our beloved Apphia and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in thy house. Philemon had a church in his house. There's other examples of churches in the house. So how does that relate to being faithful and standing on the institution of the family? It's just that the idea that a faithful family is going to have the ability to do that. I'm kind of an outgoing guy, a little bit spontaneous. My wife is a little bit more organized, and I come up with lots of ideas. And she helps me implement them. And we make a pretty good team, and our boys can help that's nothing special about that. Any family can do that. So you have an opportunity as a family. If you have a church in your house, if you've addicted yourself to the ministry of the saints, there's all kinds of opportunity for dad. There's all kinds of opportunity for mom. There's all kinds of opportunity for the children to be involved in that, to work together as a family and let God's word work out through that family. And don't forget about the extended family and the powerful tool that that can be. And I point that out because in our society, we've kind of begun to, I don't know how to say it, we, we put a lot of value on youth and the ideas and the wonderfulness of youth. So, um, we'll, and I think we can close with that one there, that thought. But turn with me to Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. We read part of this already, but it's talking about the aged women. 
to the aged men. So verse 2, it says that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith and charity and patience, that the aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as become in holiness, not false accusers, not given much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women. So we should value and utilize the extended families that we have when we have them. So I hope that is interesting, helpful, gives you some ideas that you can maybe apply to, to your own lives as we face these times of whatever times we live in. We've got situations to face where God's word can be applied and God's word here in this situation tells us how we can um, stand against the attacks of Satan and be faithful and standing on the institution of the family. So thank you very much. Thank you very much.